Hi friends, and welcome back to By Ramya. Today, you're probably cramming for the AP Environmental Science Unit 3 test of some sort. Let's dig into it. First, we're going to go over 3.1 and 3.2, which is all about K versus R selected species. The first thing you need to know is the definition of fitness. Fitness is not what you're thinking of, but in AP Environmental Science, it is the ability for an individual's genes to be selected, aka to be passed on over time. And fitness can be measured by a species' ability to survive and reproduce. Higher fitness is achieved by either one, living as long as possible, or two, reproducing as many babies as possible, right? Because that helps them survive and reproduce. So these two types, living as long as possible versus reproducing as many babies as possible, emerges based on the environment there. Is it a stable environment or is it, is it a really hostile, dangerous environment? Well, here's the thing. If it is a dangerous environment, then the species is going to be an R-selected species, in which case they choose to reproduce as many babies as possible. Most babies die. That's why they need to reproduce as many offspring as possible so that they can actually have a few surviving offspring. We can never predict who will survive. Generally, there's really bad conditions environmentally. And our selected has the mindset of quantity over quality. Rather than investing time in each of these individual babies, we just reproduce as many as possible. Why? Because a lot of them are going to die anyway. So it's a waste of time to spend time cultivating them. Whereas we have case selected species, which emerge from having a stable environment around you. Basically, if there's a predictable supply of resources, it's probably going to be case selected. The parents typically nurture them to have um, strength and be very experienced. That way they can survive competition. But here's the thing, even though not many offspring are produced in K-selected species versus R-selected, we see that the quality of the offspring is much higher, right? Because they're nurtured over time. They're stronger, they're smarter than the R-selected species. So R-selected, quantity over quality. K-selected, quality over quantity. Um, and the question I have for you is, what are humans? Are they an R-selected species? quantity over quality, or a K-selected species, quality over quantity? The answer is they are K-selected because we spend a lot of time on our offspring, right? We don't produce more than usually one to three babies in most developed countries, and we nurture our offspring, so we are K-selected. But here's the thing. Species can have characteristics of both R and K-selected generally. It's not completely binary. That being said, Let's give the example of a guppy fish versus humans. Guppy fish are selected. There's a lots of them produced. They're not super intelligent. They're not super experienced or wise, or they're not, they don't have a great survival rate, but there's a lot of offspring produced. Whereas you have humans, there's only one to three offspring produced in developed countries per household. And they are of course given lots of resources. Guppies are not given that luxury, unfortunately. Okay, guys, and that was 3.1 to 3.2. Pretty simple, right? Now let's move on to 3.3, survivorship curves. So there are three types of survivorship curves. It'll hopefully be projected right here. If you look at the first survivorship curve, the I Roman numeral, you'll see that um, these survivorship curves show that there are long lifespans, right? Compared to any of the other curves, the ones with type one survivorship curves, they live the longest. And this is because they are in a stable environment. So humans are typically type one curves. That's what the survivorship curve looks like. Next, if you look at type three curves, you can see that there are many babies, offspring, and these babies experience a short lifespan. Many of them die almost immediately because they are in a hostile and dangerous environment. So my question to you is, which of these curves is more likely to be K-selected and which is R-selected? The answer is the type 1 curve is K-selected, while the type 3 is R-selected, right? Because K, you have long lifespans quality over quantity, but with type three, you have many more quantities of babies being born, but then many of them die off.
All right. And then lastly, there's type two for the curved, and that's just going to be a mix of one and two. So they have a medium number of babies born and a medium amount of them survive. There's just a constant decline in the survival rate over time. That was it for 3.3, guys. Let's move on to 3.4, carrying capacity. So there are two vocab words you need to understand here. One is density dependent factors versus density independent factors. Density dependent factors are dependent on the population size for something, while density independent factors are not dependent. They're independent of the population density, population size. So for example, a density independent factor would be cold weather, like if there is a winter freeze going on, um, while a density dependent factor would be the amount of available food, because that depends on the population size and the environmental conditions. Okay. In a carrying capacity curve, we see that generally there is early growth that is exponential in the bottom half of the curve. But then once you go to the halfway mark, we see that growth begins to slow down and eventually it comes to a standstill. And that's what we call K. That is the carrying capacity. That line where it just flat lines out. And we're back for 3.5. Now we're going to be looking at population growth curves. I want you to take a look at this curve over here. We call it exponential growth, also known as the J curve. You can see kind of makes a J-like shape right there. And here's the thing with the exponential model. We're assuming that there are no limits. This curve goes on and on forever and ever, and the population keeps growing. That's what the J curve assumes. And so... The J curve only uses the R known as the intrinsic growth rate. Let's talk about R for a second. So first of all, what is the growth rate? So first of all, what is the growth rate? It is the number of offspring an individual can produce in a given time period, right? The number of babies someone has during a time. Uh, however, the intrinsic growth rate is the max potential for growth which means under ideal conditions, how many offspring do people have? And so it is not realistic. It's under an ideal image. And that's why we see the exponential model is not very realistic. The exponential model, it's looking at an ideal world and uses R, the intrinsic growth rate value. Okay, now let's look at the second graph over here. It's a little more realistic, not perfect, but we call it the S-shaped curve. Right, you see the S right there. It starts exponentially. You can see that at the bottom half, but then halfway it starts to slow and it reaches this limit right here, also known as K or carrying capacity. And if a graph ever t tells you like, where's the carrying capacity? You just have to look wherever it kind of stops growing over here. That is K, the carrying capacity. Now let's move on to 3.6. Here we're going to talk about crude birth rate and death rate. So first, I know it sounds like a really weird word. What do they mean? Crude birth rate, crude death rate. Well, crude birth rate is a number of births per 1,000 people. And crude death rate is the number of deaths per 1,000 people. All you really, really need to know is that the crude birth rate means that people are being born crude death rate, people are dying. Sad, but happens. So let's talk about how to calculate the global population based on these terms. Well, in order to uh, calculate the global population growth rate, the formula is CBR minus CDR over 10 crude birth rate minus crude death rate over 10. That makes sense because it's like births minus deaths over 10, right? But that is only true for crude birth rate and crude death rate. It is slightly different in the case that we're talking about just general birth rate. Now we're on to 3.6. Let's talk a little bit of math, but not too much. We're going to be talking about population math. Okay, so a couple of terms you need to know here. Immigration is the number of people entering a country. I think most people know that. Emigration with an E is the number of people exiting a country. While crude, crude birth rate, CBR, is the number of births per thousand individuals per year. And crude death rate is the number of deaths per thousand individuals 
per year. What you need to know is that immigration and the crude birth rate or just birth rate increases the population. Makes logical sense, right? And then emigration, people exiting the country and crude death rate, people dying is going to decrease the population. Again, it makes a lot of logical sense. So here are the formulas you need to know. Births minus deaths over total population times 100 is going to be the global population growth rate formula. So again, births minus deaths over total population times 100. While if you're using crude birth rate, crude death rate, it's going to be CBR minus CDR over 10 or crude birth rate minus crude death rate over 10. Now, if we're talking national population growth rate, at this point, we have to factor in immigration and emigration. So keep that in mind. If we're talking about national population growth rate, it's going to be the number of births plus immigration minus the number of deaths plus emigration over total population times 100. Again, that's just to get the percentage. That's why the times 100 is there. But then there's also CBR, crude birth rate, plus immigration, minus crude death rate, plus emigration over 10. So really, if it's crude, then you divide by 10. If it's normal, then you just divide by total population times 100 to get it into percentage. So I have a question for you. Let's say my crude birth rate of the world I just created was 10 and the crude death rate was 2. What would the percentage be? The global population growth rate. Well, we have to look at the example of CBR minus CDR over 10. That's the equation for this. So um, I said the CBR was initially 10. So 10 minus 2 over 10. 10 minus 2 is 8. 8 over 10 is going to be 0.8. So the growth rate is going to be 0.8%. Sounds simple enough. Lastly, something you need to know is the doubling time. We use the rule of 70 for this. It's actually much simpler than it may sound at first. Um, seriously, it's really simple. So all it is, is if it asks you, how long will it take for a population to double? You know, you're looking at the doubling time equation, which is the rule of 70. It's 70 divided by the growth rate percent. 70 divided by the growth rate. That's all it is. So we said that the growth rate for my imaginary nation or world was 0.8%. We would do 70 over 0.8 in order to find the doubling time, the amount of time it takes for my population to go from 100 people to 200 people, from 200 people to 400 people. Again, makes logical sense. Why is it 70? A lot of math that I don't quite know a lot about, but it's there and it works. So 70 over the growth rate is all you need to know for the doubling time. Makes life pretty easy. Okay, last um, vocab words I want to make sure that you guys know is the total fertility rate, the TFR. Hmm, what is that? Well, the total fertility rate is the average number of kids per woman between puberty and menopause. Basically, the average number of kids per woman who are kind of in their middle adulthood stage, you know, they're adults, but they haven't experienced menopause yet. So the average number of kids per woman is a good way to simplify it. And then what is the replacement level fertility? It's the required total fertility rate to maintain the current population. So in the US or in a lot of developed countries, generally, it's around 2.1 in order for there to like our nation's population to be restored, replenished uh, fully, we need 2.1 births per woman or per household. And so that makes logical sense as well, because we need two people to replace like the mother and father, right? So two people per household to replace like the adult who will eventually die. But the reason it's 2.1 and not just two is because there is a mortality rate there. So there's going to be a couple of people born who will unfortunately die before reaching adulthood. This is honestly becoming a really sad class all of a sudden, but just keep that in mind. In developed countries, it's around 2.1, and in developing countries, it is higher than 2.1, reason being the mortality rates are going to be higher. Remember what we talked about when more dangerous environments or with uh, environments that don't have uh, a lot of medical equipment, it's going to be hard for babies to survive. And so if uh, you're talking about infant mortality, that's going to be the amount of offspring that like are infant, like really tiny babies who unfortunately die before um, 
who unfortunately die at that stage in their life. And so that is why we see higher TFRs or replacement level fertilities needed in developing countries. Okay, so let's talk about age structure diagrams now. Stage one is rapidly expanding. Look right here. You see that there are is a constantly growing like population of infants, of really young people. But then as you go older and older, there is a very small amount of people. So you see there's a lot of people being born. And at the stage, you have very high birth rates, but also very high death rates. Like that's why you see right here, people are dying Um that's why there's not a whole lot of people middle-aged over here or seniors. There's going to be low life expectancies. If you see someone in stage one, there's going to be little to no access to healthcare or education. At least it's likely that there's little to no access, and it's likely going to be a developing country that you see this happen in. And stage two is expanding. So this was rapidly expanding. This is just expanding. And it's easy to identify. It just looks like a V, right? So you see high birth rates because there's lots of infants being born. However, slightly lower death rates. More people are preserving their lives than you see in stage one. So people are still surviving, a lot of them, in fact. And there's slightly higher life expectancy because people have slightly more health care and education. We can infer that from this. Again, this usually takes place in developing countries. And that's when you go to stage three. Stage three happens when the country usually becomes a little more developed. We see that there are lower birth rates, just slightly lower um, than here. There's going to be a low overall death rate. That's why there's a lot of middle-aged adults and honestly, a lot of seniors as well. There's going to be a high life expectancy. Almost everyone makes it to the end of their life. And there is, we can infer good health care and higher education present. Again, you generally see this in more developed countries. Stage four is contracting. And so this is interesting. It's so different from the rest of them. This is when you actually have very low birth rates. So you can see that the birth rate is lower than the existing population. This generally means the total fertility rate is lower than the replace, replacement level fertility rate. So there are less than 2.1 babies being born in any household. So that will lead to shrinking population. Again, there's a low death rate. There is a very high life expectancy. Almost everyone is making it just like here. The difference from three and four contracting and stationary is that contracting has shrinking birth rates. Again, good healthcare education. Generally, this happens in developed countries. We see this happen in, for example, Japan. The last thing I want to cover for this cram is population momentum. What is population momentum? Well, it's a continued population growth, which is observed even with a reduction of birth rates and an increase in mortality rates. So what does that mean? Well, um, let's give you an example. Let's say in, for example, Malaysia, there were, there were a lot of offspring being born in a certain year and their population doubled. All of a sudden, their birth rate shrink. However, the population is still going to keep growing just because the initial growth was so large that the population growth and its momentum is still carrying over. Even though the there's lower fertility rates, TFRs, than before, we see the population is still growing because of its previous momentum of how it expanded so much. It's going to continue expanding for a long time. And that is population momentum. Okay, so I really hope that this review was helpful to all of y'all. Um, if you did enjoy it, feel free to like smash the like button because that tells me you want to see more of these and I will make more of them. And so subscribe if you want to get notified whenever I post a new video relating to education or equity, in this case, a study guide. Thank you so much. Have a wonderful day. And please let me know how you did in the comments below if you did well on the exam and just update me because it makes me really happy when I see a comment that at least my video helped in some way. And that means that I will keep making more of them. So if you'd like to see that happen, for sure, smash that subscribe button and like button and have a wonderful day. Bye. This is Ramya signing off.